Let us continue in prayer. Dear gracious God, we do give thanks for the opportunity we have to worship on this Sunday before our National Day of Thanksgiving. An opportunity for us to give thanks just for the, the mere opportunity we have to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and to um, share the gospel not only with each other but with this community. We give thanks that you have blessed us with your son Jesus Christ and, and for his love for all the people of the earth. And we pray, Lord, that as we come together, the sins of our life, those things that keep us from full communion with you, that, that you will once again wash those sins away through the, the blood of your son Jesus on the cross. And, and we give thanks for the mercy and grace that he offers to all of us. We pray, Lord, that as we open up the scriptures, that you will open up our hearts and our minds, that in hearing your word, we may be your faithful disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our, our scripture passage today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Jesus is, is teaching the crowds. And he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, and is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. Well, you might not have known, but October was National Mental Health Awareness Month. And we have said for several years we wanted to have a special Sunday to, to recognize that. Um, some Sundays, Nancy Summer has given us a Westminster work on NAMI. And so this year we wanted to um, recognize that, but we were having our series. Well, that's that big board in the back in the narthex, our Walk Across the Room series. So uh, we decided to pick a Sunday in November, and this is that Sunday. So I asked Rachel, my wife, um, Rachel has a master's in theology and a doctorate in psychology. I asked her to help me out with this sermon. Um, but in my sly way, um, rather than help me out, I just kind of shifted it over to her. So she's going to share our message this morning. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's the um, Sunday after he was in Jamaica for a week. So he didn't have to write a sermon. <clears throat> well, first I'd like to start out and kind of take a show of hands. Anyone in here, please raise your hand if sometime in the past week you have felt anxious or worried. Just raise your hand. Good, good. Looks about like pretty much everybody. So everyone in here today is kind of included in this sermon and in this message. Um, you know, the last month has not been great for our mental health, has it? First, there was the stress of that last Cubs game. There was actually a point where I was curled down and said to Bill, turn the sound off because I can't stand this. Then came daylight savings time where it got dark at 4.30, and let's admit it, the Chicago Bears are terrible. <clears throat> then, seriously, we truly had a very brutal presidential election, and all the opinions after that election and all the protests and uncertainty that came with the election and heading right towards us like a speeding train are the holidays. With food to make, gifts to wrap, traditions to honor, mother-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, brothers, uncles, and those nieces and nephews who've always really needed one good spanking. For many Americans, this is the most anxious and the most depressing time of the year. But the issue of mental health in the United States is much bigger than just this month or next month. 
The United States has the highest rates of mental disorders in the world by far. And mental disorders kind of breaks down into two categories. There are genetically based mental disorders like schizophrenia and sometimes bipolar that are very serious and people have to take medicine often their whole life. That is a relatively small group of who we're going to talk about today. The other huge group is people like you and I who just raised our hands and said, I've been anxious and worried. But these people, it goes up to a clinical level. And what clinical level means, it affects your job, maybe you have to take medications, maybe you go seek therapy, and it affects your relationships. And that's a huge part of who we're going to talk about today. The statistics in the United States are actually kind of staggering. Psychiatric medicines are the second best-selling class of drugs in the United States, only behind heart medication. The National Association of Mental Illness, or NAMI, says one in five Americans has a mental illness. 43.8 million Americans have a, a mental illness in any given year. 18% of adults have clinical level anxiety, and 10% of adults have clinical level mood disorders. 50% of people who have substance abuse issues also have a mental illness. But the statistics don't stop there. 17% of teenagers have a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. And 14% of teenagers have seriously thought of committing suicide in the past year. Half of all chronic mental illnesses, so those are emotional struggles that you will struggle with your whole life, start by the age of 14. We live in this great country with so many resources. We have wealth, we have food, we have peace, we have free public education, we have entertainment, we even have air conditioning. We have a life that so many people in the world could only dream of. And yet we have the highest rates of sadness and worry in the entire world. What is going on? Well, this morning, I want to offer you a few possible explanations and even possible solutions that I have seen from kind of sitting in the trenches of mental health. They're not going to be the normal things you usually hear, like get more sleep, drink less alcohol, exercise. It's not going to be those kind of suggestions. You guys are smart. You know all those. What I want to offer you today are some bigger, biblically-based ideas that Christians can offer to a nation that is clearly somewhat troubled in its mind and spirit. So let's start with what I see as problem number one, and that is the separation of values from mental health. I think Christians are often scared to speak out about values and mental health issues. We're kind of scared that we're going to be called closed-minded or judgmental or old-fashioned. But you know what? History teaches us a very different story. For hundreds of years, the church was the leader in caring for people with mental health issues. From the Middle Ages on, monasteries, hospitals, and group homes for what they called the insane were actually run by churches. They started a program called Humane Care, where they took care of the physical, mental, religious, fellowship, even um, employment needs of those with mental illness. This care was actually revolutionary because it treated those suffering from mental illness with respect. It saw them as whole people. Then, about 150 years ago, a man named Sigmund Freud came on the scene. He was a doctor, and he's the founder of modern psychiatry and psychology. And he was an inventor of what they called the talking cure, that instead of having people help you, you come and talk about your problems. Well, one really important thing that Sigmund Freud said that caught on was that religion was not helpful, it was actually the problem, that it was the cause of most mental health issues. His work, along shortly after that with the introduction of psychiatric medications, quickly replaced the church as the leader in mental health care. And you know, although talk therapy and medications are really useful and helpful tools, when you subtract moral values from mental health, a stunning legacy has be been created. Routinely, in surveys, it's found that psychologists and psychology professors are by far the least religious professors on a college staff. And psychologists are by far the least religious white-collar profession in the country. The goal of the mental health system now, with values subtracted, 
is to act in a way that makes you happy or fulfills you as a person. I'm sure you guys have all heard this, right? Even Oprah says it. Now, that kind of sounds good on paper, but here's an example of what such an idea looks like in real life. Let's take the topic of pornography. Most pornography in the United States is legal for adults. Society would say, if it's between two consenting adults or in your house, what's wrong with it? It feels good, right? It doesn't hurt. So other than a belief system that says pornography is wrong, there's no reason for anybody to stop looking at it. However, with the advent of the internet, the United States now has what is being called a pornography epidemic. Pornography is a $40 billion business worldwide, and $20 billion of that is spent in the United States. Porn sites on the internet get more visitors than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. It makes more revenue than professional baseball, football, and basketball combined. 68% of young men view it at least once a week. The effects of pornography have become so bad that the very secular, non-religious sources of GQ magazine, Raquel Welch, and Pamela Anderson from Baywatch have all spoken out how, about how pornography is destroying marriages and, quote, ruining men emotionally. But look, our scripture passage today is set in the middle of three chapters from Matthew, Matthew 6 through 8, in which Jesus is teaching his followers a whole new standard of right and wrong. Listen to these amazing things he says. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. He said, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. The Bible teaches us right from wrong, not to make us feel bad, but so that we can have a good life. Even Old Testament teachings, such as the Ten Commandments, are re actually really preventive mental health measures. God is saying, live this way, and uh, you will avoid a lot of disasters. Not too long ago, I was working with a man who had been married for 25 years and had an affair. And he was ready to leave his marriage. He told me how his wife was holding him back, and he no longer loved her. He also told me that he was a Christian. So we sat there, and he told me the name of his divorce lawyer and his, where he was going to live in the future and how he was going to set up visitation with his teenage daughter. And so I looked at him, and I just said, if you're a Christian, why don't you go home and try to fix your family? And he sat and he stared at me in silence, and then he just said, I've been to two or three other therapists and a counselor at work. Not one of them has suggested that I do that. Then he quietly said, do you think my wife and daughter would take me back? Don't be ashamed of the Bible. Learn it. It's the word of God for our benefit. If you don't share the good news that it teaches, it is likely that no one else will. The second problem, and this is a huge one in the age of social media, is comparison. Research shows that one of the core problems with mental health in the United States is comparison, jealousy, and envy. It is this simple. You would think that if you live in a $200,000 house, you would be pretty happy, right? It's going to be a nice house. And research shows you are pretty happy if you have a $200,000 house, as long as all your neighbor's houses cost $200,000 or less. However, if you take that same $200,000 house and put it in a neighborhood of $600,000 houses, Quite quickly, your happiness and satisfaction disappears, and your levels of stress and depression go up. So what is, it he what is the thing that it is here for you this morning? How are you negatively comparing your life to others? Is it your salary, your weight, is it likes on Facebook, your level of education? Is it your kids' grades, the prestige of your job, your marriage, your age, your health? Or is it to some standard inside your head or the way you thought life was supposed to be or the good things you thought you deserved? A young lady in my office a few years ago who really was beautiful and incredibly intelligent 
was spiraling into a serious depression, much worse than I typically see. And she told me that when we tried to look back at what was going on, she told me that a year before, she had taken the ACT as a junior in high school and gotten a 32. And she took it a second time and got a 32. Now, for all of you know, right, that's an incredibly high score. But her whole life, she thought she would at least get a 34. After that, she applied to five colleges, three of which were Stanford, Harvard, and Yale, and she had not gotten into those three colleges. And the reason, so all of that was causing this terrible depression because of the standard inside her head. And she came to me because she was struggling with the idea of having to settle for U of I's honors engineering program, <laughs> right? That's what we're doing to ourselves and to each other. I told her, I could have never gotten into U of I's engineering program, I said, let alone the honors program. But that's what we're doing to ourselves and to our children. Such negative comparison assumes an attitude of scarcity. There's not enough. And an attitude of scarcity is fine if there's a famine or a war and you have to struggle to get enough resources. But we are thinking that there's not enough good things in life for everyone. If someone else succeeds, I lose, I get less. If I don't reach this level in my head, I have failed. But Jesus preaches something very different. He preaches a gospel of plenty, of abundance. Look at what we read today, Bill read today. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they are? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of them. Jesus wants us, Christians especially, to get a grip, to quit worrying and to believe in his goodness. Believe that, as Scripture says, he cares for you. And then, amazingly, Jesus asks us that if we're going to compare ourselves to other people, we should do it in a different direction. For our mental health and for the mental health of others, Jesus wants to look at our brother who is struggling and help him out. Let me tell you, we once had a contract in our office with UIC's medical school. So medical students would come and talk to us when they were struggling. And I started to see this pattern that over a couple of years, I had a lot of medical students who came in and wanted to get tested for attention deficit disorder. And I'd go, you're a medical student, <laughs> right? Like you've made it this far. Why do you think you have attention deficit disorder? And they'd say, well, there's like four students in the class who are getting better grades than I am. And I'd say, okay, I know you can see the four people ahead of you in line, but make sure you turn around and see the millions of people behind you in line, right? Who could never dream of going to college, let alone getting into medical school. And that's the kind of comparison Jesus wants us to use for our benefit and his benefit. If you've got two coats, give one away. You've got healthy kids, then visit some who are sick. Your brain is doing okay, then sit with those who are troubled. We believers are supposed to be caring for the orphan, the widow, the prisoner, not envying our neighbor or our sister-in-law. We as Christians need to let people know that they are valued children of God, no matter if they hear voices, if they have a criminal, criminal record, if they used meth yesterday, if they have been abused, or even if they have been abusers. The mental health of this congregation, this community, this country would be greatly improved if we believed and started to act like Jesus Christ gives more than enough. More than enough value, love, forgiveness, redemption, and hope for us all. And not just barely enough, but Solomon in all his glory enough. Finally, a central problem with mental health in the United States is that we equate mental health with feeling good or with being happy. Really, our country has so much anxiety and depression, especially amongst young people, people 30 and younger, largely because we have such a messed up view of happiness. The past decade, there's been a surge in studies on happiness. There are hundreds of new books on the subject. Happy money, happy church, and even happiness for beginners. But here's the problem. Recent research from the National Academy of Sciences has shown that happiness, when you define it as feeling good or feeling satisfied, 
might actually not be that healthy for you. Here's what the studies show. The higher someone rates themselves as feeling good, the lower they tend to rate themselves in purpose and meaning. Researchers have come to call these people takers. They take from life what feels good to them. In the same study, the higher someone rated themselves in having meaning or purpose, the lower they rated themselves in feeling good happiness. Researchers have come to call these people givers because they live for something greater than themselves. But what shocked the researchers was this. Those who rated high in happiness but low in meaning or purpose, the takers, which actually was 75% of the study respondents, actually had immune systems that were less resistant to disease than those who rated themselves high in meaning. You see, when you live for something greater than yourself, like raising your children, or caring for your elderly parents, or spreading mercy to each other, or a religious belief, it doesn't make you, always make you feel good or feel happy in the moment, but it gives you purpose and resilience. You know, one of the funny pieces of information that came out of this study, any of you who have a college student who, when you turn over the phone and you see their name on the caller ID, you feel kind of sick in your heart a little bit because you don't know what's coming. They found in this study that parents rate more happiness, that feel-good happiness, eating, watching TV, or exercising than talking to their children, which actually made me laugh out loud. Okay. Our North American obsession with happiness may be most harmful to the current generation of young adults. Tell me if you've heard or think if you've heard these phrases. These young adults have grown up hearing this that they've been raised to, quote, follow their dreams, to pick the perfect college, to find a job they love. Statistically, they have become our nation's most stressed out generation because when they don't feel happy every day or when things go, get tough and they get disappointed, they think they're failing. But today in, in today's chapters from Matthew, Jesus promises that a good life of purpose won't always feel good. Listen to what he says. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. Whoever holds tight to their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Do you want your mental health to improve? Don't wait to feel good about yourself or about a situation. Get up every day and do what is right, no matter how you feel. I have had many, many people in my office of every age who are sad, who are Christians, who tell me, I can't feel God, I don't feel like going to church, it doesn't feed me, I don't want to go to work, I don't feel good. They've taken medicine and they've done talk therapy. And I say to them, here's all I have left to offer you. Get up every morning on time, go to work, clean your bathroom once a week, go to church, read the Bible, pray. If you don't feel better in two months, then you can give up right? Mental health is not defined by feeling good. Mental health is defined by making wise and right decisions. As Christians, we have something so much better to offer the world than happiness or good feelings. I mean, seriously, a donut or a piece of pizza can make us feel good for a couple minutes. The teachings of Jesus actually offer us purpose and meaning that will last a lifetime. This is what I see every day. There is a whole mission field out there of people who are struggling. We have a lot to offer them. Christians were the first great providers of humane care. They were the first to see those with mental health issues as people of value, worthy of thoughtful treatment. And they did this because the Bible had taught them to think differently. A recent study from Duke University puts it this way. People who are more religiously committed seem to cope better with stress. One of the reasons is because religion gives people a sense of purpose and meaning in life. And then the study goes on to say this. It is also possible that the beliefs and teachings advocated by the Christian religion, like forgiveness, love, and compassion, may become integrated into the way the brain works. And these brains are more resilient. So now science itself is proving 
what the Bible has always known. Sigmund Freud was very wrong. Faith does not cause mental illness. It protects us from it and makes us more resilient. That is truly good news for we Christians to share with an anxious and depressed nation. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for everyone here today. Thank you for the incredible plenty that we live in. Thank you for all the wise and good minds in this church today. Help us not to be ashamed of the gospel. Help us to share it with a world that's struggling. Help us to share the incredible plenty that you've given us. And most importantly, help us to get up every day and not first think about how we feel, but think about what you want us to do that is right and good. Help us to be bold.